What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN Game Scoop. I'm your host, Damon Hadfield. Joining me this week is Justin Davis, Ooh. Sam Claiborne, Mag Pooks, and Ryan McCaffrey. Howdy, howdy. We've got a great show for you this week. We're going to talk about Horizon Zero Dawn. We are going to talk about the new game from the creator of Splunky. Mm. I don't know if you guys heard about this. No. It's very cool. Uh. But first, Middle Earth Shadow of War. Mm-hmm. Found out it's going to have microtransactions. Uh-huh. What is, what do you, I just think they're funny. They're funny. Go ahead. <laughs> tell, tell tell the audience what they are. <laughs> Staple of Middle Earth lore. Oh yeah. Uh, the official word. Uh, the developer is Monolith. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, they say players can purchase loot chests, war chests, XP boosts, and bundles through the market to strengthen their army. Ooh. Using you can't you know there's an in-game currency and then re- gold which you buy with real world money. Players have the option of purchasing gold. And uh, it can be required by, or it can be acquired by spending real money. Also, participating in community challenges and completing specific milestones will earn you gold as well. Uh, there's been a strong reaction from the IGN commenters, but, bef- but first, give me your reaction. How do you feel about a sixty-dollar single-player game having microtransactions for not just cosmetic items? I think the randomized loot chest is the worst part of this. Mm. That yeah. is the thing where it's like, if I want. Whatever it's going to be, maybe it's something cool like Aragorn's, you know, sword or something like that. Yeah. Uh, if that if that's the case, then I only want that. Then do I have to like roll it a bunch? Loot chests, man. You can't you can't escape <clears throat> them anymore. They're everywhere. They're going to be everywhere, especially next year. They're already yeah. everywhere. I think you know you said sixty dollars single player game with loot chests. The operative word there for me is single player. Actually, it's not yeah. sixty dollars because you know Overwatch is sixty dollars, but it has loot loot chests. To me. Cosmetic items, whatever. You want a blue hat for your character, buy the blue hat for your character. But but cosmetic items, I think, only have value in a multiplayer context. In a single-player game, it feels way grosser and le- makes a lot less sense than in a game like Overwatch. If you really want a legendary skin or you yeah. really want to show off in an MMO so you buy you know, the elephant mount or whatever. And hopefully they're like cool things that you would want to play with and like change the game. But then again, then you're just paying for yeah. things that you know aren't in the game. But I think I'm not saying this is a good thing, but there is a sl- one s- sliver of devil- devil's advocacy here where we all used to buy GameShark discs to mess with our games. And we all used to buy Game Genie to uh, you know augment our games. And like a lot of this is just cheating. It's like it's XP. just skipping parts of the game, right? Yeah. It's like getting XP or gold. And it's like basically you're we did do that to third parties at one point. Mm. So it's kind of interesting. Like if if like GTA withheld their cheats next time and just yeah. sold them, it would be awful. But we have done that before. I want to pick up on something Justin said and that's yeah. single player. And for me, I'm uh a big proponent of, I love single player games. The older I get, the less time I want to spend playing online with other people. Sure. And you know, uh, like quality single player games have been fewer and further between overall this generation. Uh, Games as service is the, is the, the -hmm. the way to to be now, you know, Titanfall and uh, Battlefront. And then finally we're getting campaigns attached to those sequels. But I think I, I, I don't, like this at all. However, I think it's kind of a necessary evil in order to have good single player games cuz all these games the reason they're all multiplayer and games of service is so that they can have long financial tales. Hmm. So if these loot boxes and loot crates is are what it's going to take to for us to continue to get good quality single player focused games developed as opposed to just a price hike no, as opposed to them not getting made at all and just having the publisher oh, I mean, say... That would be another way to do it, right? It's just The game was just $70. Raise the tag of the, the game. Well, that's not going to happen. That's just, no, I know. That's I'm just saying that would solve the same problem for them. It would, uh, but yeah. I, 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 so again, I don't like it, but I think it's we kind of have to grin and bear it for now if yeah. we want single player games. I mean, I think, again, like multiplayer games uh, do this, you know, they do special events and double XP weekends and stuff like that to goose up their player base because the more people that are playing a game like Overwatch, the better the experience is for everybody. There's more people to matchmake against and just more, you need as many people in that game as possible hmm. and they make more money and then, you know, there's, a again, a better multiplayer experience and in a single player context, I don't think loot boxes make any sense and they think they feel a lot grosser. But what about Borderlands? Borderlands had plenty of loot boxes, right? Well, but not not this style of loot box. Okay. And it difference? was also a multiplayer game. Well, I guess yeah. Like right. if you Except wanted, to, I, it was a single player game for me. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure, and for a lot of people. But I mean, if you wanted to customize the appearance or the vocal barks or whatever of your character, yeah, there's a certain sense that you're doing that for the other people that you're going to be playing. With. Yeah, sure. Uh, 
The official uh, explanation from Monolith reads, By simply engaging with the world and playing through Middle-earth Shadow of War, you earn items like gear for talent and unique orcs for your army. These are the same items that are found in the market within loot chests and war chests. Gold merely allows you to get your hands on them immediately, cutting down some of the additional time that would have been spent winning more battles, tracking nemeses, completing quests, and assaulting fortresses. So, like, playing the you game. You win. Just pay, pay money you to win. not... Exactly. Give us extra money, and you won't so have like, to play the game. I want to play Shadow of War, but I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to purchase any of micro, these microtransactions. So, I wonder, is it going to feel like it's just been padded? That's on like, the designers. To me? Like, right? Like, I mean, I, I, yeah, I got I to gotta figure that in a number of these cases, I don't know about Monolith specifically... But I've got to figure in a lot of cases, these decisions come down from the publisher on high, and they're told, yeah. okay, developers, put I this mean, in. They're the ones the developers, paying for it, right? Yeah, I would think the developers, a lot of cases, again, I, I'm not, I don't work at these companies, but I've got to figure it doesn't always go over well internally, but that's the, re, the business reality. So it's on the designers to implement it in as smooth and fair a way as possible. We also, uh, piggybacking off something you said earlier about the business side of it, uh, it protects against used game sales. Uh, if you buy a game secondhand, uh, the publisher gets zero dollars, and that's different than you know used cars or this and that, where you know that's that's part of the car system. Um, so now, for every copy of the game that's sold used, you know Monolith and WB have an opportunity to at least extract a little bit of revenue out of people because sure. a certain True. percentage of them will buy loot boxes. Um, and you previously couldn't do that in a single player only game. Have you guys seen the? You know how this has been around in Japan for a while, but you can buy like a randomized toy. And like you open it up, yeah, like blind boxes. Caps, they do blind boxes, capsule, capsule machines. Yeah, they do yeah. those. I mean, they're yeah, it's taken over the whole gambling, everything, and the collectible scene and the video game scene is pretty gross. Yeah. So I was at Disneyland this year, and uh, they had um, like those, like blind boxes for mm-hmm. stormtrooper pins, and the people I were I was with really wanted this David Bowie one. It was like David Bowie stormtrooper, and like the others were like, not nearly as cool as that. Yeah. It was like the you know the Ziggy Stardust lightning bolt. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was super cool, but like they kept. <laughs> dipping back into this and I, and like I was eventually I was like how much are those and they were like over twenty dollars it was like, you know, like something really expensive wow and you know and like I think both of them had spent like over a hundred dollars by the end and they were those type of people that this like hooks yeah yeah you know and there's that random role like yeah there, there's totally an economy and a philosophy around whales and like all this stuff yeah. behind that where like people will keep on buying things randomly to get the thing they want. It's taken over mobile games. It's taken over a lot of stuff. You know, it used to have just a line of like 20 figures. You're into one piece, here's these 21 piece figures, but now they're all blind boxes. And if you want the yeah. character you want, like, good luck. What is so, whoever developed that, such a smart move <laughs> on their part. The ex- also a dick move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the reaction uh, from the IGN readers on our news story was almost entirely negative. Uh, comments saying, <laughs> there's no excuse for this. Microtransactions and full-priced retail games are not okay. Uh, one guy said, okay, I'm not buying it at launch. I'll wait when it's $20 or less on PSN. Uh, small messaging footnote. Remember like a month ago when Monolith announced that that was really cool fan service thing where you'd be able to import your nemesis yeah. Yeah. from Shadow of Mordor? They should, should have, have they reversed. Should have, yeah, they should have announced this mic, uh, loot box thing first and then come with the fan service thing to just yeah. smooth it over a little bit. Yeah, I will say the excuse for like the blind boxes that Sam and I were talking about is trading. I mean, the, the real reason is making more money, but the, but the outward-facing reason is, well, you'll collect these figures and you'll trade yeah. for the ones you want. Yeah. But again, I keep coming back it's to the single-player cards. game thing. There's not even any economy to sort of, you yeah. know, un- like, okay, I don't want this, but I want this, and to trade with your friends. So, totally. I don't know. It's no good. Well, Middle Earth Shadow of War is out October 10th. I'm still, you know, I still want to check out the game, still want to play it. I like the first game a lot. And great. Hopefully the microtransactions don't. There's spoil. a lot of depth to it. We Both just uh, we yeah. actually just posted a bunch of new video on IGN. Uh, we get the, yeah. went, went down yeah, and just played days ago, it right? more. Yeah, and it's, there's just, it, it's, I don't mean to uh, insult Assassin's Creed, but it sort <laughs> of feels like a sort of more fully fleshed out, deeper Assassin's Creed, excluding Origins, because we're just sort of diving into that now. But there's just, there's a lot going on in in, uh, Shadow War. It seems really good. Yeah. It doesn't turn me off to it. I mean, I'm annoyed that, like, it, it's, it even exists and we have to talk about it. But yeah. I mean, we're we'll not going to buy them and who cares? That's what Damon said before. Like, we'll have to see how grindy it feels. Like, yeah. if it feels grindy and they're like, hey, you loot boxes, then that's a really, really <laughs> different game than if you yeah. just play it and it d- doesn't even, it's not a thing you need to ever pay attention to. Yeah. Speaking of release dates, we got a release date for Horizon Zero Dawn's first expansion, The Frozen Wilds. It is out November 7th. It's late. Is that? 
release date have any significance to anyone else? Xbox here? One X. <laughs> hey, don't buy that console. <laughs> Keep playing this cool game you already have on your PS4. It will oh, undoubtedly no. be optimized for PS4 Pro and yeah. look very gorgeous. Game's already yeah. stunning on yeah, PS4 the, Pro. If they do tune it up for Pro. Yeah, that is the same release date as uh, Xbox One X and Crackdown 3, of course. Uh, it looks like yeah. it's in, uh, <laughs> like, it looks like Yellowstone or something. There's like these weird chemical mm. pools What's or supposed volcanic to- pools. Did you see the hot springs in the yeah. image? I, maybe I didn't catch it. It's yeah. so cool. So yeah. it's like an image of this big panoramic view of the mountains, and it's like winter. And I thought the same thing as you. Oh, it's just going to be either northern or up in the mountains or something. But then there's these rainbow, the, those rainbow colored pools that I think I think are from Yellowstone. It's really gorgeous. I mean, but it's also no different. You know, when Skyrim was first announced, we're like, so how boring? You know, a big snowy yeah. continent. But then there's a swamp and there's other stuff. Like I, I expect this to be similar to that. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, Horizon is a PlayStation 4 exclusive. Do you think it's a play by Sony to sort of like gain or pull some attention away from the launch of the Xbox One X? No, no just totally. They just thought well, that. Well, what I do think it is though is if you look like you know Sony, they've got these great. Th- they've got the third party marketing partnerships, so they've mm. sort of got the mind share, as it were, on Battlefront Two and on Destiny Two. But yeah. first party wise, they've got Gran Turismo Sport, and then Uncharted is. Not even really holiday because it's coming out what next week or yeah. the week after. It's yeah. August this month, so they don't really have a, a a big first party presence this fall. And this is a way where they can they can yeah. bubble yeah. back up one of their killer games from early in the year. Yeah, that's true. And get it some some major attention during that fourth quarter and have it be kind of a, almost a, a mini you know big first party game, uh, even though it's just an expansion to an existing game. Yeah. I mean, I I respectfully. I do think that they're deliberately going after Microsoft and trying to take a little bit of their thunder away. I mean, I uh, they'll probably have some game of the year edition, but this is you know digital DLC, so it's not like you know when you have to ship eight million copies of a physical disc somewhere, like you pick your date, you know, and then you say, okay, the game has to be finished six weeks before that, and print the discs and get them in stores. But for this, like they could have come out late October, they could have come yeah. out later in November, but they picked this date deliberately, I think, so that you know on sites like IGN and YouTubers and Twitch streamers. You know, you're gonna yeah. see the Xbox, and you're gonna see Horizon side by side. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it, it is coming out a little bit later than I expected. Yeah, I think what, it's late. It was late. That game came out in February, very late February. So it'll been like ten months yeah. since its uh, right. release. Yeah, nine months. So uh, I was expecting. I, I don't know what I was expecting since they do have Lost Legacy coming out this month. But uh, I do want to check it out. I re- actually recently jumped back into Horizon Zero Dawn after five months. Wow. Because I got sidetracked. Did you know it, where any of your stuff was or anything? <laughs> well, it t- there's definitely like a learning curve to relearn the combat system because the combat system is pretty deep. You've got melee and ranged weapons, multiple bows, different types of ammunition, elemental effects. Then you have these bombs you can use and traps you can set. And then you have your rope launcher. And then the dinosaurs, the robot dinosaurs have different like yeah. weaknesses and then parts you can shoot off. It's like a lot to I found sort of by the relearn. end game, the rope launcher was like a cheat code, basically. Yeah. Rope launcher is pretty... It's pretty great. It's really cool. Uh, but the game is awesome, and I'm I'm really actually glad that I'm getting back into it. Cause it's definitely. Did you get to the like the? Do you know where you got like story spoiler free wise? I have. I'm I'm a little bit lost in the story because I always do like side quests. Have you first. been? To, can you go to the whole map? I guess is what I'm asking. I still have Fog of War over part of the map. Okay. I guess I haven't opened up the whole map, but I'm so like 20, really cool. 20 hours into it. I think it. The, the final areas of the game are the best part. I like yeah. the desert and then the final area. Which yeah, is- so you can play that game. Like I played that game a lot, and I put it back down and picked it back up, and I didn't even make it to the desert. Like it's on my list of games. Like Damon, I oh, want to no, go yeah. back to it, but I'm a little scared to try to pick it back up. Like. I think a lot of people, when they saw the screenshots or videos or watched any streams, you probably saw the early game areas, and there's way more variety in that map. It than, gets than much more expecting. beautiful in the yeah. desert and then the final area, too. It, it's Those are the best areas. Like That's the best part of the game. You have a lot to look forward to. Yeah. Total side note, random prediction. I could absolutely see Horizon Zero Dawn 2 being mm. a launch title for PS5, mm. whether whether that's like fall 2019 or fall 2020. Yeah. like The timing pretty much works out. That that would be a, a big heavy hitter they could lead with on yeah. the new box. Good for cool. Gorilla, right? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, they, I, I always they, they thought Killzone, Killzone was so just kind of so-so as well. I, know, I never really well, loved any of them. Kudos to Sony for giving them the creative freedom to yeah. to say to yeah, let them pitch something new and try something new and not just fold them up or or say, okay, well that didn't <clears> work, <throat> so you're going to make this now because mm-hmm. we need this. Yeah, this box checked in our portfolio. They said, hey, come bring us a new idea, and they did, and. They were empowered to run with it, and they made a great game. Yeah, it totally uh, t- totally pulled me back in. I'm having a great time playing it. I do wish, 
However, and do you know what I'm going to say? That you could climb everything? No, I was actually <laughs> about this with Justin. I wish I could glide. Because oh, there's so yeah. many, like, I, I, get up, I, I get high up, and I'm on top of a mountain, and I'm like, well, now I have, I have to walk down this mountain? Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about the climbing in Zelda, the gliding. Yeah, the gliding. So I want to just be able to glide over this it's beautiful valley. It's the best loop like, to yeah. climb up somewhere and be like, what's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go check it out now. Yeah, that's actually what I really miss from Zelda. I wish, I wish I could add gliding it's, into it. You horizon. see some little glint in the distance. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to hop it out. on over there and see, <laughs> then climb back up somewhere else tall. <laughs> Or just like sometimes uh, there's like a Stalfos, he comes up out of the ground. I'm like, peace yeah. out, bro. Yep, later, dude. Out of here. That's what I've been playing. Why don't you guys share with the listeners what you guys have been playing? Ryan. I just reviewed Batman The Enemy Within. That's right. Episode one? Episode one. So it's season two of Telltale's Batman game, first episode. Super liked it. I really, I liked the first season a lot because it took, it's unapologetically M rated, it's pretty, pretty yeah. brutal at times, and yeah. it just takes some very established characters from the franchise and just does completely crazy things with them that for the most part pretty much worked and season two kind of picks up with those consequences having yeah. been played out and and sets a lot Do of people is it a spoiler what the villains are uh in season two yeah well season so the first episode is about the riddler the riddler yeah i, yeah, I can totally for sure tell you no spoilers that it's the yeah. Riddler shows back up, comes back to Gotham, and all they tell you is, well, he's just been gone for a while. Everybody thought he was dead. He comes back, and he is the uh, the focal point. But he's actually the least interesting character in the episode. Not that he's bad, but it's all the peripheral characters that that inform the like way more dramatic, tense decisions. And it's off to a great start. I, I really am curious to see, uh, excited to see where this season goes. I never, I didn't get to uh the first season it's good i just yeah i, I hear it's good i just i i've kind of felt like some telltale fatigue a little bit but i uh, i totally get that yeah. uh i would but if it's if you if you're a batman fan like i am i i think yeah. season one is totally yeah. worth it cool I, they also finally announced uh wolf among us too i know i can't believe it it's so, so like, great now we just need tales series. from the borderlands too <laughs> yeah it's true <laughs> sam i know what you've been playing i don't know if you can share I can share that, but that's not what I was going to talk about. You know, I've been playing the Mega Man Legacy Collection. Two. Two. The second one. Yep. And uh, there's four games in it. Uh, seven for SNES, uh, eight for PlayStation, which I love. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd love it, but mm -hmm. I love it. It aged really well. It has really bad anime cutscenes that are hilarious. They're so fun. The voice acting is perfect in that game. Dr. Light just flubs lines. <laughs> and, and they left, left it, it in. <laughs> he just misses a word or says half a word. At one point, this this robot boss just cuts off Mega Man and goes, shut up. <laughs> and Mega Man shuts up. Yeah. He's, he's like, like sure. And Mega Man also has the voice of a little girl for some uh, reason. Yeah, he does. And then every time uh, the, the dog comes out, Rush, there's a person doing dog sounds and he goes arr, 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 arr. <laughs> and he'll like fly and they show this one animation with just like barely anything happening and, went, arr, 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 and it's like too long it's so good it's wonderful but then the actual game is like Capcom, Marvel vs. Capcom era like 32 bit just yeah. like oh my gosh it's incredible yeah it's like sprite work which I don't remember it looking that like pixelated yeah. but you it looks really cool you can hold down the button and fire constantly mm -hmm. instead of that awful charge shot I'm very anti-charge shot and of course Mega Man 9 and 10 are yeah. immaculate and great they're super good really they're not hard. as good as two or three so like that means that the whole collection is not as good as the first collection yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. plays and then i've also been playing uh the 1977 hit shark you know oh yeah we that? played some shark at shark. california extreme yep. have you guys even seen this cabinet i've never seen no. it before so it's called shark very primitive it's 77 you said yeah it's like big cabinet and it's squat. four players uh, it's black and white screen, and all there is there's there's a maze at the bottom, and then this open area at the top where this dot is floating around, and the dot is a person swimming. Seventy-seven's really early. Yeah, or maybe seventy-six. It, it may, and then there's you're a shark mouth, and so four people are just. But it's a like C. it's basically yeah. It's either a C or a U or a backward C oh, yeah, or right. an upside down U. And so you're competing to like get out of the maze, and if you hit a wall, you start over. So you're like carefully navigating a maze, and then you get up and eat the dot. Yeah, it's a swimmer. race to get out of the maze and eat the swimmer, and then the person who like gets to five first wins. But your controls are just four buttons in four directions. Wow! And the buttons are like they're like smaller than an eraser on a pencil. They're the buttons have never been used anywhere else. It's I don't know why cool. they chose it. It's just these tiny little buttons. Old like games the like that. Switch D-pad. 
Yeah, they said no you know, concept. <laughs> like, it, obviously, that's like switch yeah. it's yeah. clunky and primitive, but, like, playable, right? Like, it was you can so have fun. Yeah. We but, had like, fun. like, why, like there's why, no, why, there's those, no, why those tiny buttons? There's no music. Yeah. I don't even know if it had any sound. At we all. only missed out on it. Next to it, they had a shuffleboard Ooh. machine that was 78. It was a Bally Midway game, and it was black and white. And it worked so well. It was a bowling ball roller. Mm. And you go, and it's just like shuffleboard in a bar. You know, you just get up to it, and you can knock off the other one. And you go, yeah. dink. That works really well. And then I've also been playing a lot of 1978's uh, Atari Fire Truck. Yeah, which we also that's played. Well. That's a cooperative game. Yeah, so there's one two... person drives in front and one person drives in back. <laughs> the fire truck is long, and there's two parts of it. And so the person in front is is steering, and then the one in the back <laughs> has to, like, keep the back end of the fire truck from, like, running into buildings. It's just yeah. cars black and, and white, top down. Great. Simple as possible. It was really fun. And then you have a horn button, and the horn <laughs> button does nothing except for make a loud horn sound. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it was that game, but one of the uh, monitors we, we saw, actually, there was a real spider that was inside, a, inside the monitor. Yeah, it was like in someone's <laughs> just garage. Just behind the glass. This there is was a just big a real spider. <laughs> they bring it out. It was like, damn, there's a spider. And it was just like <laughs> hanging there like a mummified spider corpse yeah. in the screen. I played that game later with a friend of the show, Jared Petty. Mm. And he's, I don't think he likes spiders. I don't know if he's afraid of them. I'm not going to say that. But he's, he's, you know, he doesn't Ooh. like them at all. Ooh. No, thank you. And I showed him, I showed him the spider and he, he was not pleased. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, that's at California Extreme, which is the yearly uh, like arcade. Yeah, machine six hundred machines. It's really fun. I don't, it's the largest collection of arcade machines on the West Coast, or something. Yeah, ever so. for that day, I'm sure. Right? We played Bad Dudes for a couple minutes. It was yeah. boring. Bad Dudes is pretty good. I'm bad. <laughs> uh, Justin, what you been playing? Uh, you skipped yourself. I guess you already. Well, I was at yeah. Horizon. Uh, I am still playing Eternal Card Game. There you go. I play it every night. It's it's actually kind of a problem in the sense that it. I mean, it <laughs> sucked up my, all the time. For my daughters it, like, are crying. I mean, <laughs> all the game time, not all yeah. the time period. Like I have Tacoma that I've been waiting to get into, and I have Pyre that I absolutely adore, but I haven't yeah. finished yet because uh, Eternal Man, that game is really really good. As I've said before, it's half Magic the Gathering, half Hearthstone, sort of the best parts of both. Um, uh, and I played a lot of it on PC, but now that it's on my iPad, that's like the perfect way to sort of lean back and yeah. play that game. Um, no, I, I like that game a lot. It's just tough for me. Uh, <laughs> card games, I'm currently playing. Hearthstone, yeah. Eternal, uh, Elder Scrolls, Legends, the Plants vs. Zombies, Heroes, Shadowverse, Calculords. What else? Uh, well, I guess that's enough for now. Yeah, so it's like hard, like, hard games. you don't need it anymore. It's hard to find time. Did you guys try the VR game that I have hooked up by my desk mm-hmm. that Dan was making a lot of bunch of people play last week? Oh, was that Lone Super Echo? Hot? Yeah, Lone oh, Echo. Lone Echo. Echo. Did you try Lone that? Echo. Not, uh, well, yes. I've played it. I played it at some event. Previously. Oh, cool. And you watched good. a tiny bit of like the tutorial scene, I think, yeah. when I was playing it. But like you are like freely floating in a spaceship. Yeah. And that works really well in VR because you have jets like Tony Stark style. Yeah. And then you can also. Um, yeah, basically, you use the controllers and you, you grab, grab stuff for momentum. Yeah. yeah, and you pull yourself yeah. around. And I'm so excited to play it. Perfect. Like it's every, just right for VR. I feel like almost every VR game is like, this is really cool, but there's always like an asterisk. Mm-hmm. And this is like one of the first VR games that like, no, like no qualification or like excuses needed. Like it's just super dope and awesome. Yeah. Like I really want to dive into it. For and me. you're around this... Uh, you know, AI character, a woman who's like you're a robot and helping her, and you go through all this stuff. And it has another one of those things where it's like a big 3D display that you pull out of like the ship, and then you can like zoom in and like mm. you know, just like that interface is like so futuristic and cool. And uh, Dan was like, if you stare at her too long, she gets mad at you. I'm like, all right, Dan, <laughs> how did you even find this out? <laughs> yeah, why are you staring at her? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have been playing one other thing a little bit over the weekend, which you guys will never guess. Bad dudes. <laughs> no. Um, oh wait, wait. Is wait it? He's been playing a lot of GBA yeah. Game Boy. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. 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 I'll give you a drill dozer. <laughs> I, w- I played that a little bit earlier. Is it uh, one of those weird Star Wars games only for GBA? No, I've been playing Bionic Commando. Okay. Elite oh, Forces. Nice. Yeah, I would which is the Game Boy Color mm-hmm. one, which is cool because they add a People female, a female Bionic mm-hmm. Commando to the game. A Bionic Commandress. Yeah, <laughs> Commandette. Uh, but then. The the new feature that really uh, took me by surprise is that certain levels. Are you, are you do you remember this game? Yeah, do you I know this very well. Yeah. Certain levels have a first person sniper mode Whoa. that it goes into, and it just it's just like a uh, crosshairs on screen, and then you find the enemies, and then you shoot them, and this huge splatter yeah, of blood yeah. comes out. It's cr- I wasn't I wasn't expecting it at all. It's like really violent. <laughs> and I meant to I meant to look up what the rating for that game was on the show because it's like 
you can kill people in the game uh, in a first person setting and yeah. blood splatters everywhere. So I feel like it. How is it not rated yeah. M? Or maybe Ever it since uh, that first uh, head explosion with Master D. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. It's, all it's done. been part of the game, it's part of the series. <laughs> Get used to it. Bind of Command, Elite Forces. Uh, Does it tell any story additionally in it? Yes, there's the same. Does he marry evil a different wife arm? arm. In it? <laughs> not, not the wife <laughs> arm. It's the same evil organization from the first game is back, and Super Joe is behind enemy lines, and you have to go and rescue him. Mm. What makes him so super? Super yeah. Joe. Is he? We'll never know. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Uh, the developer of Splunky, Moss Mouth, which is uh, so Derek, Derek, Derek U, U. Derek U created Splunky, and then he created this. His developer name is Moss Mouth. Uh, it announced a new game today called UFO Fifty. Ooh. That is a collection of fifty single and multiplayer games. I love it in an eight bit style. Andrew Goldfarb, tweet if you're okay. <laughs> no, I mean I also like he also made Aquaria. Like he's I, every every game he's Aquaria, made has been though. excellent. It was a uh, it was the so indie Metroidvanias. Are all their age. You swim in. Yeah. He was like the first indie Metroidvania. Wow, I gotta check it out. Uh, pre Spelunky. I'm gonna double check that that was Derek. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure it was. Sure. So this well. is 50, 50 8 bit style games he that he's like and them. he's brought on other developers to work with them too. The developer of, of uh, what is it, Downwell, mm -hmm. yeah, worked mm. in some of these games, which I haven't played, but I hear really good things about yeah, Downwell. Sure. Uh, and oh. so they explained a little bit more. Was it? Yeah, there was two of them: Derek Yu and Alec H H Haloka. I don't recognize right. the name. So they, they answered some questions about uh, the games in this collection today. How big are their games? In general, the games are slightly smaller than commercial 8-bit titles from the 80s. But rest assured, they are full games, not micro games or mini games. Yeah. Completing the entire collection could easily take over 100 hours. So is that real? Like, like, like Derek and Derek, you we trust. Incredible game yeah. developer. Uh, again, never made a not hit game. But I'm skeptical. Like, there's no way there's 50 games like the size of Castlevania like, or Mario One, right? Yeah, uh, but, that, but he's not saying that. He's saying they're uh, slightly smaller. Did you play Retro Game Challenge? Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, but like, there's I'm only expect, like seven games. I'm expecting on that. more. Yeah, but they're pretty full. Yeah. Uh, he says, are the games connected in any way? The story of UFO 50 is that the games were all created in the 80s by a fictional company that was obscure but ahead of its time. That's, cool. That's great. They're all connected by a unique 32 color palette and other restrictions we decided on to make them feel more authentic. What kind of multiplayer is available in the collection? All the games will feature a single player mode and roughly a third of the games will feature either cooperative or competitive multiplayer modes oh as well. Gracious. That's what I thought it would be focused on. That seems really cool. What Maybe it has a version of Shark. Maybe. What platforms is UFO 50 coming out on and when? We are planning to release the game on PC first in 2018 and then move on to other platforms. We're still deciding on the price, but we want it to be an easy purchase. I'm so excited. So there's going to be like 50 games of all different types of 20 bucks style. probably. Yeah. yeah. This is like my favorite. I, I mean, I know he said they weren't micro games, but I love WarioWare, especially for the yeah. retro feel of those micro games. And I love Retro Gaming Challenge for this exact reason. Yeah. And then NES and Remix. A, like, I love the idea yeah. of shuffling the 8 bit look and like making a more playable game yeah. out of it. So it's really Yeah, cool. it's yep. cool. Uh, there's a trailer for, the, for this <clears throat> collection uh, called UFO 50 out right now. If you take a look at it, there's a wide variety of games everything from platformers, puzzle games, so the, 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 looks like some sports games, some turn based strategy stuff. So it seems nice. pretty cool. It's UFO 50 from the developer. Do you pronounce Splunky. it UFO or, or UFO? Uh, UFO, yeah. It's not UFO. <laughs> SNES or SNES? SNES. SNES. Oh. UFO. Uh, it is August now. Whoa. Are you sure? That was fast. We're in August now, so it's time. Uh, Here we go. Check in. We started this last <laughs> month. <laughs> okay. We started this last month with July. We, we took a look back at the July 92 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly. So that's 25 years why ago. Why 92? Just because it's 25? Or no, I just I, I forget the reason why. Oh, <laughs> it was because I just happened to be looking through it. We you know we have this <laughs> old magazine library, and uh, you know Zelda's out this year. And in the mail section of the July 92 uh, issue, Link to the Past had just come out, and all these people were writing in about Link to the Past. And I was like, well, let's just you know. you're supposed to say I was in the archives doing yeah. my exhaustive <laughs> research, research yeah, prepping for, for the show every for week. 20 questions. Yeah. 
uh, in Game of Thrones, how do they get those the chains? The maesters? I actually yeah, know the, the answer to this. The maesters, yeah. Well, I for each know. thing they learn in their maester school, they get a link. So they get a link for, you know, like winter, healing or, or healing or, or you know, this and that. And so the heavier, the more they know, the heavier their chain is and the more they're weighed down by their knowledge. I feel like we should have some chains for yeah. our, all of our knowledge here. Scoop chains. Uh, but now this is, so this is August 92. And the the console war, the Great War, <laughs> was raging at that time. If you guys it? remember, console war. Hold on, we, are, we, we can't look at every single page. But I, I love the ads. I know. The oh, ads they were great. they were the best. But I want to read you the uh, letter from the editor from Ed Ed Simrad. Does anyone yeah. actually know Simrad. you're familiar with? I don't. Him? I know yeah. of him. You know of him from the mm-hmm. man. I don't know. Never met him. The uh, edit letter from the editor. The headline is the System War heats up. Says if you are one of the unfortunate group of players who bought either the Genesis or Super Nintendo game systems last year, you probably are not going to be too glad to hear that your $160 to $200 investment in a system has just been cut in half. Yes, the system war is going great guns, and neither Sega nor Nintendo will give the other company any chance to get a sales edge. Over the past six months, the system prices have changed so often that retailers no longer have any idea as to what price to put on their inventory. Oh, that's a weird thing to have happen. As soon as the prices are changed, they have to be changed again and always downward. However, it now looks like the prices have gone about as low as they can as this last price cut necessitated major changes in the system configuration. What? Now with so only one with only one controller uh, and no pack and cart, the systems right. have apparently reached rock bottom. Well, Only one pack and cart. But then they redesigned the Genesis. We don't yeah. even get those well, I'll tell anymore. You, and that, that set the standard. I mean, that's from, from there forward. It, it was no pack in game and one controller yeah. from there on out. So that's interesting. I, Thanks, Sega. I, didn't, I didn't, guess I didn't realize it was the System Wars that we really had to thank for that. Yeah. He says, like that. while not great for the stores, the players who sat on the fence thinking about upgrading are enjoying every minute of the war. Yes, Chris. So, like, people talk about console wars. The yeah. you know, this is where it comes from. This Christmas shopping season, when about sixty percent of the toys are sold, should prove to be one of the best ever for the retailers. They will they will sell a lot of systems, but not make a lot of money. Still, don't feel too sad for the poor store owners, as everything they will lose on the sale on the system, they will make up and then some on the sales of the games. Mm. There are not too it's many people who believe that a cartridge is really worth sixty to eighty dollars. Comerica, for one, has proven with their Aladdin project that good games, albeit eight bit cards, can be sold for less than twenty dollars. I don't, I don't remember Comerica or their Aladdin oh, project. I know Comerica. You know really? They made bootlegs uh, for the NES. Interesting. What does he mention in context for? Uh, I th- it sounds like they're a retailer, uh, a proven with their oh, Aladdin project. Okay, maybe I'm of something else. That good games, albeit eight bit cards, can be sold for less than twenty. Well, so maybe, maybe it's that's their bootleg like a bootleg Babbage's thing. Ah, oh, what am I? I got. I'll think of what I'm thinking. We don't know. Uh, Ed continues. Unfortunately, there are losers to this new 16-bit war. With the Super Nintendo at $99, how many older 8-bit NES will Nintendo sell at $79? The handwriting was on the wall about the eventual demise of the NES, though, as most of the licensees have already switched over their R&D efforts to SNES game production. This is 1992. They're yeah. still talking about the the NES. NES. Well, remember there was that system that refresh right That's, like, right at the end. Been, Yep, well, that or crazy redesign on the, the NES. top loader. He says Sega has to be smiling though. They have lowered their prices to the point where the NES users now can inexpensively upgrade to another system. Many of those will switch from Nintendo to Sega. Another nice point is that the price war is spreading over into the portable area. This time it is Sega versus Atari. Sega's Game Gear is coming down to $99 and Atari is rumored to be bringing the Lynx down to around the $80 price point. I think it's a very cool system. It was just like, was actually wasn't very uh, portable. It was batteries. Yeah. So he says, who is going to win this latest war? It is quite possible that nobody will ever really know. <laughs> <laughs> Sales figures are provided by the companies and aren't audited. Nintendo claimed to have sold over 2 million systems in three months last year. Mm. Few analysts believe that number and place the actual amount as about half that amount. What? Now they are saying they will sell 6 million more Super Nintendo systems this year. Sega stating they will double their user base. Who was right? We'll have to wait until after Christmas to see. Until then, the one thing that we can count on is that the real winner will be the game players. As for the first time in gaming history, the new systems are actually priced at a point where almost everybody can afford to upgrade. It says that at the beginning he said there would be no winners and that <laughs> it was terrible for gamers. And at the end it says uh, yeah. the gamers will win. No, I mean, the system wars were really serious business back then. Yeah. Nintendo and Sony 
hated each other. Like people think, oh, I mean, yeah. we should read the book Console Wars. Like it's PlayStation, hang on a second. Like Jay Harris. Like, like PlayStation and Xbox. Like oh, they're competitors and they hate each other. But like they, they don't. Like they don't. <laughs> they just don't. The way that Sega and Nintendo yeah, did. They were absolutely out to murder each other. Yeah. Uh, really funny ads in that issue. In this month, Out of This World on Super, Ni- oh, Super Nintendo so got the uh, Editor's Choice Gold Award. Yeah, the coveted wow. Editor's Choice Award. This month uh, got an 8998 from EGM. That game was awesome. How did uh, they get four people, four <laughs> editors to play every single game all the way through? <laughs> to completion. To give it a review. <laughs> the, each editor's reviews, man, looking back, it's like they're practically tweets. If yeah, they yeah, fast yeah. forward, they're, really, they're, they're barely, really there's like two tweets. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always love the gaming gossip section uh, written Quarterman. by Quarterman. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. In this issue, he says, his rumor is, Atari's Jaguar is now ready for full-out production with designs for nearly two dozen softs now in the starting stages. Softs. Oh, games. The machine will take that. gamers into visual regions previously uncharted by home or arcade games. Can't wait to see this cat in action. Hey, hold, oh. up, hold up that Adventure Island ad. The listeners. <laughs> this is... The There's mess. just a naked oh, guy Adventure hanging Island. from a bird. That was that was. I remember the soundtrack to that game was phenomenal. Is uh, that for Adventure Island? That's too? for uh, Super Super Adventure, Super Adventure Island Adventure. on the uh, Super Nintendo. Uh, Look how big that magazine, Master is. Higgins. We're going to page forty here. Uh, the first segment of the Game Doctor, and I don't know if you guys know who this is, but he writes no. a whole intro. And where everyone's supposed to know who the game doctor is, and like okay. finally the game doctor is coming to EGM. And you wrote in uh, questions about gaming hardware and like problems, oh. not like cheats about like like my NES flashes and doesn't yeah. play the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brad Gerard from South Carolina wrote in to say, "I am a proud owner of an NES. I only have one major problem. I was playing a game and there were a lot of enemies on the screen. The action on the screen then started to slow down. Oh, cool. <laughs> what's wrong? With Can you my tell console? me what caused this and why this happened? And the game doctor just." Gives an explanation. The more on-screen yeah. objects, the more memory is required to move them around. Most video game systems use what are called sprites as the See, characters. See, what you have to do is you, you just have to keep it a little bit cooler. So I am a fan of yeah. your NES. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You'll see less slowdown. And then uh, and Ice water is good for it. In the preview section, there's a preview of Ninja Gaiden 4 for Genesis. And that game never came out. It never out. happened, yeah. There's no so. Ninja Gaiden 4. Does it look good? It looks like an NES game. Uh, you know, just it, yeah, it just looks like the 16-bit version of the NES games. But you know, I don't know whatever happened. Few to that screenshots, game. they would take a Polaroid photo and just cut it out and then just put it in oh, the layer. Yeah, that's what the screenshots are all really poor quality. Yeah, they're very kind of bluish, like like they're taking <laughs> on the screen. Hudson <laughs> Hawk and Hook in the same yeah. issue in a special advertising segment. Uh, oh, really? And then on page 94 is a Super Star Wars preview. Whoa. And I want to read some of the copy on of this. Uh, it says, 15 years ago, yes, 15, Whoa. we watched the adventures of Luke Skywalker, who, after receiving a distress call from a beautiful princess, was catapulted into an adventure of almost mythic proportions. 15 years ago? After more than a decade, we are still enthralled with the Star Wars saga. That's 1992. <clears throat> LucasArts Super Star Wars mirrors the fascination that is still present whenever we see the movie this is a game underlined that plays like a movie yeah. underlined. <laughs> so that game was only 15 years after Star Wars, yeah. and now we're 25 years away from that game. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Super Star Wars makes abundant use of the SNES's Mode 7 capabilities with plenty of scaling and rotation, the effects of which will definitely make you dizzy. That doesn't I sound think good. there's a picture of a Star Wars Death Star trench run in this that like that game did not look like. Yeah, no. <laughs> the gameplay like and everything. The gameplay is flawless. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what an accomplishment. We don't do previews like this anymore. Yeah, this is a preview. Is not, Can I start using that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> gameplay. Luke encounters many strange creatures in his quest to rid the galaxy of the evil empire. In addition, there are bosses at the end of each level that are guaranteed to reduce your life expectancy. <laughs> Look for Super Star Wars by LucasArts Games. Fight hard and may the force be with you. This is their preview. Yeah. Also, the Did cart. The cart was eight megs. Write that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like eight it sounds megs. like the back of the box. Yeah. LucasArts I, PR. What, what, what's in the fact file? Uh, the, at this at the time of this writing, the game was fifty percent complete. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I, the totally cart size is eight megs, and uh, the number of levels not available. Yeah. I'd totally forgotten yeah. that previews used to say, like, this game's 85% complete, or this game's only 20% complete. Japanese magazines yeah. still do it. Famitsu still does this in their previews. So bizarre. It's great. All right, stay tuned for September, when we will once again check in with what was going on in System EGM. wars continue. Back then. Let's check in with the listeners. Hey, listeners. Listeners, remember, you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com, just like David from Austin, Texas did. 
He says, the first time I ever listened to Panic at the Disco okay. was also the first time that I played my favorite game ever, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Now, when, whenever I listen to Panic's first album, I can't help but think of Knights of the Old Republic. The reaction is strong to the point that when I hear certain songs from that album, I will see specific planets from the game in my head. I also have the same reaction with the first Darksiders game and Ed Sheeran. <laughs> so my question is, do you guys have any albums, songs, or musical artists that remind you of certain games? And he's not talking about the game soundtrack, just like stuff you were listening to while you played the games. So I, many. I have the same thing that happened to me. So uh, I used to run around in Quake 1 with, instead of... Quake 1, wow. Yeah, with, um, uh, what was it? It was... What album was that? Oh, it was the Metallica Load, the Load album. Yeah, I just that was like the same time, and just would so run around just goes to bragging the uh, yeah. Yeah. the what were, whatever they were called in <laughs> Quake One. I don't even know if they had a like it was a race of aliens or monsters. Yeah, yeah to uh, to Metallica. Load. I remember the Sonic the Hedgehog era being you know the exact era that uh, Pearl Jam and Nirvana and yeah. Smashing Pumpkins and everything came on the radio. So yeah. like 90, you know 90, I don't listen to that stuff, but uh, I did in high school and middle school is when I really remember it from. And though just I remember Sonic the Hedgehog and those bands. Like yeah, it's just well completely one. For me, games. it's Sega Genesis high school and grunge albums. I, w I definitely went through like an angsty phase where I'd sit in my room with the <laughs> lights off and I'd play totally. Shining Force and Shining Force 2 and listen to uh, you know, stuff. I really remember uh, Holes Live Through This. Yep. I remember listening to that album a lot. And oh, then yeah. on the other side, I remember listening to Tom Petty's Wildflowers album a lot yeah. while I played through those Genesis games. I got that. <laughs> I remember when you could get 10 CDs for 10 cents. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I just did that over and over again. You say, yeah. sure, I'll cancel before they yeah. charge me the $20. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I think there's a couple different. There's ones. a couple of them, yeah. and you could use them all. Like, yeah, I'm gonna game the system. That's yeah. how I'd get those CDs. And I remember at the time I had a Sega CD yeah. player. Yeah. That was my yeah. first CD player. Me too. Yeah. I listened to music on my Sega CD. So like, cool. there, that's you know, yeah. indelibly. I listened to Green Day Dookie in my Sega CD. Yeah. Dookie was right there for sure. <laughs> what was cool is in the in the era before Offspring. before in those early CD-ROM gaming <laughs> days, that was pre copyright prote copy protection. Yeah. So. Uh, you could actually take a game disc yeah. and put it in a music CD player. D track one was the game, the data track. If yeah. you tried to play it in an audio CD player, it would just you just it would play, but you'd hear nothing. And then tracks two onward were the track <laughs> to the soundtrack. And I still keep a handful. I have some old school PC games that I still enjoy the soundtracks to. There's uh, uh, there's this post apocalyptic taxi combat game. Called uh, Quar uh, Road Warrior, which was or no Quarantine, which had a sequel, Road Warrior later. What a but uh, Quarantine that has a great soundtrack, and then the aforementioned Quake One mm. was all was uh, the Trent Reznor. Oh yeah, stuff. Uh, no way. He did the I soundtrack that. for that wow. game. So That's and crazy. tracks two onward, I actually brought it in for Eric Sapp, who's a huge Nine Inch Nails fan. Oh. Our, our graphic is one of our graphic designers here, and just said here, just copy. You could go ahead and you know rip tracks two through whatever, because I don't think there's any way to legally give Trent Reznor money to <laughs> to get that. So, is it video just, game music or is it like music music? No, it's music. It's sort of atmospheric. I mean, yeah. 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 That's really funny yeah, yeah. that they had him do that. Because go after the show, like, look up look up the Quake soundtrack yeah. uh, on YouTube well, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's interesting about. because now he's like a very successful um, Oscar film winner. You know, yeah. Oscar winning film uh, soundtrack composer. So. I never realized I was such a weirdo for always just listening to the game music. Like, well, no, no, I, I, I mean, I know lots of people that do, but I just never, it never even crossed my mind growing up to be like, well, I'll yeah. just listen to the game music. I didn't even think about turning the TV volume down and playing yeah. something else. That's outside. me today. I almost yeah. always will listen to the game music today. Oh, for sure. But game music's gotten really good. Yes. For the most part. Uh, and that brings us to Video Game 20 Questions. Our suggestion this week comes from Colby Snyder. Mm. Let the questioning begin. Where's Colby from? He does not say. Oh, see, because if, if he was from the Midwest, that would inform. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think I know the game. Uh, so. do you, <laughs> do you, uh, does your character speak? Hmm. I, wow, I don't think so. Do you mean just on-screen text speak or like words come out of the, your television? I hadn't thought about it that far. <laughs> like, because it is. Yeah. If you, no, you, I mean, you can clarify. You can clarify. I don't have. I think they're both. I think either one. Either. Of I don't think either one happens. Okay. Okay. I don't think so. Is this a pre-1990 game? No. Pre-2000. 
No. All right, so we're past 2000 then. New-ish game. I mean, not new-ish. Character doesn't years, talk. I mean, uh, we, I think, okay, pre-2010? Yes. Okay, we got our decade. Console exclusive? Is it a console exclusive? Yes. It's not a Mac game. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at... I wasn't here for that, but I We're heard looking about it. at... Uh, <laughs> Xbox, PlayStation 2, GameCube is pretty much... Well, we can confirm that. Well, I'm just, you know, we don't necessarily have to go there quite yet. But that's where... We're, I'm, I'm turning this way again. I'm making them the same mistake, so... <laughs> yeah. Is this <laughs> a GameCube stay. generation game? Um, that's that's original Xbox, PS2. Uh, I don't think... I No, I don't so think is it, so. Is this a handheld game? Yes. Ooh, okay. Let's do that. Okay, so what? It's, I mean, it's so almost certainly Game Boy Advance or DS or DS. Yeah. Uh, or okay. Age. Okay. Yeah. I mean, is this a GBA game? No. Is it a DS game? Yes. Whew. I was so worried that it was going to be. Uh, is this game about self betterment? <laughs> no. I like where you're going. Though. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Cooking Mama, Brain Age. Yeah. I mean, okay. Is this game made by Nintendo? Yes. That's that's a big help. That's ten. All first right. party, so Ninten- first party Ninten- DS, N- Nintendo Dogs. Yeah, could be WarioWare. Nintendo Dogs is a good one. But is that about self betterment? <laughs> no. <laughs> through through training a pet. Yeah. I wonder how my Nintendo Dogs doing now. If I were to turn on that game, would my dogs just be happy to see me? Yeah. It's a corpse. Yeah, they <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's bones. My Animal Crossing villagers are furious. It's just like a grown up dog. And you're not interested anymore. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care about you. <laughs> yeah. Are there dogs in it? Uh, no. <laughs> could still be Nintendo Dogs, right? Because there's puppies in it. Are puppies dogs? Uh, it could be Animal Crossing, because it would. Because there's some hesitation over whether your character speaks, and I don't know off the top. I don't think you speak. You're mutant Animal Crossing, right? Are there sequels? No. Oh. So Mario and Animal Crossing are out. Why are got sequels? Lots of sequels. Yeah. There's no. That's oh, they're out. out. They're out. Yeah. out. Um, what didn't get sequels? First party DS game that didn't get sequels. Uh, Advance Six Wars. Did, was there a was there a sequel to Advance Wars? Yeah, there War? was. There was. Okay. Well, but it depends on how Damon. That was the final one. The the, the DS one. What about Yoshi Touch and Go? Yoshi's Touch and Go is really good. Or, I really like uh, that game. Mario sixty four. DS. Oh, I mean, those don't act, technically have sequels. Does this take place in the Mario, Mario universe? Talks, though, good question. Does it take place in the Mario universe? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right then. <laughs> <laughs> Could be one of those two. Well, so I don't know, like. That's a good question because it knocks out Advance Wars and all oh. that weird stuff. But like now, does that include Mario Sports? Am I- well, that's what I was just thinking. Like, was there a Mario Golf game, Mario Tennis game for DS? There was golf, but there was a sequel on the 3DS. There may not have been golf. Is this Star Yoshi? No. Mario Universe game. Is this a remake? No, that's fifteen. Yeah, slow up, <laughs> slow your roll. No, no, but we need those are the games that we we are <clears throat> asking about. There was uh, Princess Peach, Super Princess Peach on the DS. Yep, that's a great one. Not very Mario good. Mario Universe. You know how? So it's the it's like, hey, finally, you Peach is on her own adventure, yep. and then the game is uh, yeah, emotion based. Her for emotion power is like when she's crying, this happens, and when she's angry, this it's happens. Accessed. It's not great. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's probably that, or or uh, there's also Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga got, games, but those got sequels. Those got sequels. So is there anything else? I think there's a really good chance at Super Princess Peach. Yeah. It would. Is this a good. is this a platformer? Yes. You play as Princess Peach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Super Princess Peach. I don't know if she speaks though in the game. I don't think she does. I mean, she m- no. She cries a lot. She yeah. may speak in the way that like Mario speaks a you little. Just like Princess Peach. Yeah. yeah, some stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't think she was. There's real. Uh, yeah, that was 2006 when that game to D- yeah. came game came to DS, and I didn't play that one, even though it got pretty good reviews, like sevens. Uh, it's yeah, just it's three out of five. Is it's that supposed to be Xbox 360? Yeah, because 360 oh, is 2005. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but this game is supposed to be really easy. Yeah, I remember. I for some reason I have a vivid memory of that game. I was running a a handheld games website at the time, Um, and so you know I ran the site, reviewed the game, and it was totally like first party Nintendo platformer, and like it's just bland. It's just boring. Yeah, it's just not very interesting. And it's like Pikmin and pretty sexist. (laughs) Well, hey hey, Pikmin, Pikmin. Pikmin. sorry. Yes. Uh, And then one detail that I thought might be challenging is that the, the developer was 
Toze, T O S E, but they're like a ghost developer that they never even put their name on their yeah, phone. Yeah, that they, is weird. And Nintendo has hired them on, to work yeah. on many, many games of the years. And Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, he's still like the producer on the game, but they hire this like ghost developer to sort of like farm out the heavy lifting yeah, of the development. They basically, do. Yeah. And then Nintendo publishes it. That was a good, good game to do. So many Brings good DS franchises that are just uh, orphaned on the DS. I would love to have like, like a really cool Super Princess Peach game. Like that would be great. Yeah. We the Switch or Switch, sequel to Switch Rub is Rabbids. touchscreen, right? Yeah, I don't know why. I just guess I haven't. I don't know why I play my Switch every day, but no, I don't ever use. It's the not touch stylus features. based anymore. It's nice, like just yeah. yeah but I just it makes touch. me wonder if we could see like Elite Meat Agents or you know some of that stuff that kind of was gone for a while come back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, Colby Snyder. That was good. You guys got there. Well played, everybody. It took place in the Mario universe. Yeah. <laughs> And that is all the scoops we have for you this week. Remember, you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Ryan. My name is Damon. This is IGN Gamescoop. And we're out.